Welcome back to part three of this special three-part edition of Cultural Caravan TV. I'm your guest host, Rabin Nickens. Considering the current conflict between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, which is garnering global attention for the political, humanitarian, and economic implications worldwide, this Women's History Month, we thought what better way to explore this context than by bringing you the perspectives of two phenomenal Black women of diplomacy who combined have a wealth of knowledge of both the region and navigating international relations in a crisis. We have 40-year diplomatic veteran, former U.S. ambassador to Senegal, former director of University of Central Florida's diplomacy program, and author of Diversifying Diplomacy, My Journey from Roxbury to Dakar, Ambassador Harriet Lee Elam Thomas, as well as policy expert, Ambassador Pamela L. Spratlin. Ladies, welcome back to Cultural Caravan TV. Thank Spesi you. Thank you. If I yes. restore power, Polly, I'll take care of them. Oh, oh, you're going to have to school me on what you just said. <laughs> we said thank you in Greek and Turkish. And oh, oh, thank you so much. See, see, now, you know, you, you, you've given us so much contextualization. Those of you who did not catch the last episode, episode two, they really gave us a foundation on Russian culture and the experiences and the impact of Black people there, um, which, uh, which I think is very important before we get into the whole idea of conflict. But I think it's also important for us to know a little bit about um, how you navigated the different perceptions that you have both of you in your respective posts as black women in places where a lot of times black women are not seen like what what do you think was part of what helped with uh the the positive perceptions that that uh you said that you had um particularly you know when it comes to things like language Rabin uh ya hatilo skazata Здравствуйте, меня зовут Памела Спратлен, и говорить по-русски это было очень-очень важно, когда я была в России. So I just said that, uh, good, good evening, my name is Pamela Spratlin, and I'd like to say that being able to speak Russian was very important when I was in uh, Russia. It, uh, the language skill is, it puts you in a different kind of category. Uh, it's not that you're, 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 you're always, I'm always a black woman 100% of the time. I'm never not in that role. But when I'm able to connect with somebody in the Russian language, or when I was able to do that in Russia, my pronunciation was very good. I can't say my grammar is always the best, uh, but my pronunciation is quite good. And people greatly appreciated that feeling of connection. So when I, I've, I've heard it said that when you, somebody understands the English language and you're speaking to someone in a foreign country, you communicate with the head. But when you're able to speak someone's language, you can touch their heart. And I do think that being able to speak the language, being willing to show that you took the effort, you went that extra mile to learn the Russian language, it helped me enormously. I was given a year of Russian language training before I went to Russia, I learned this when I was over 40 years old. So people thought that it was pretty remarkable that I was able to learn Russian and get to a point where I could communicate with my interlocutors, um, even if it's just a matter of greeting people. But when you can go beyond that and engage in even the most superficial conversation, it's an enormous gesture of uh, a desire to, to communicate and to connect. I said, thank you very much in Turkish. Ben Harriet Hanum, Tanishtim Bazat, Chok Memnum Bolden. I'm Harriet, Miss Harriet, as they would say. It's a pleasure to meet you. And in Greek, it would be, Yasu Tikanis, Kalaise. Hello, how are you? Imuna, Okolutos, Mofotikos Akolutos. I was the cultural attache. Now that was in 83 to 87, so forgive me. Uh, I learned, as I said earlier, Greek at 42 and Turkish at 47. And each of those were year long language training programs. And my goal was to, again, defy these perceptions that they may have had of us as a people based on the fact that the most inexpensive television programs to disseminate worldwide were often those which featured us in comical positions and not in substantive roles. And I was determined to turn that around so that in Black History Month during that month, both in Greece and Turkey, 
I spoke about science and technology, about Blacks in science and technology, both in Greek and in Turkish, to audiences in the capital city and then the major cities around both countries. And in that fashion, I educated them in two ways. They learned about sectors of American culture, of people of color that they knew very little about, but they also learned that I could communicate in their native tongue. And it gave me a credibility. It gave the American embassy heightened respect because it let the country members of the sort of the intelligentsia understand that we cared about them. And we wanted to communicate directly, not indirectly with them. I was in uh, Turkmenistan, which is one of the most closed countries on earth even now. Uh, and uh, we were going to take an embassy trip over to look at these dinosaur tracks that were historical. And one of the things that we did was we, there were no hotels. This is a country that's closed. It didn't have very many tourists. And so we had to arrange to stay in a private home. And that was a fascinating experience because they, you know, uh, in, a, in a country that is trying to determine whether its Muslim identity is going to become more important. They still had the Soviet traditions of sharing either tea or something stronger. And um, we, would, we, we were there, they shared with us, they talked about what their experiences were like. And we got to know them, as you said, because we were in their home in a way that would have been impossible had that trip not taken place in that way. So yes, and I and I also like to say that while we do have the challenge of stereotypes from you know the the less flattering aspects of being African American that can sometimes be on display. Sometimes I think it's a way of just trying to connect with someone. Also in Turkmenistan, I happened to be at a border checkpoint, and our passports were being checked, and the person who was uh, the border checkpoint individual made a point of saying to me in Russian, this is a country where people are speaking Turkmen, made a point of saying to me in Russian that he had seen an Eddie Murphy movie. Now, I can't tell you how odd that struck, struck me because this is a country where nothing gets through. How did this individual see an Eddie Murphy movie? I don't know, but I think it was his way, not of, of trying to belittle African-Americans, but of trying to find a way in his one moment to talk to a foreigner in his life, perhaps. This is my way of trying to connect with you. At least that's the way I chose to interpret that particular um, moment. But to your larger point about language, it's crucial. Um, and it's also crucial in what we'll be talking about later in this issue of how people define themselves, the role of the Russian language where I was uh, was serving, uh, but everywhere this issue of how we communicate, how we show up, and particularly the languages we use are very, very important. Sometimes we think about our identity as a negative. Like, just briefly, is there are there any ways in which you felt like being Black actually worked to your advantage in yes. your role as a diplomat? I think so. In uh, what way? One, uh, there was this in, 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 innate curiosity, first and foremost, um, not only are, are, I think, in terms of my experience, my race, but my gender. In many of the countries where I've served, it was a patriarchal society, Senegal, Mali, the Ivory Coast. And I will tell you in Greece, even though the Greeks men try to claim they're terribly macho, the women control what happens in most homes. They control the money and what happens in that within those four walls. So it was fascinating for me to be able to observe that and to display how it was important to be who I am as a person of color representing the United States of America. Greece, Turkey, and Cyprus have never been the best of friends. And so in the midst of the 1964 crisis, um, people in Greece still feel that that was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And they won't, and they feel the Ottoman Empire it was the day before yesterday. So they've carried this inherent disdain for the Turks, the likes of which you wouldn't believe. But I would work at breaking that down. What did I do? I left four years in Greece and went and spent four years in Turkey. Well, they would continue, the Greeks would say to me, which did you prefer? 
And I would say, I can tell you the four years I was in Turkey, no one said anything negative to me about the Greeks. But again, none of this would have happened if we didn't speak their language. Um, I would say just in terms of what were the advantages, uh, there was this, uh, this understanding as Ambassador Elam Thomas has said that we are, diff we are different and that we have a history that has a lot of pain attached to it. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly when I was serving in Central Asia, this is a part of the former Soviet Union where people did not always feel equal to the Russians who were running things from Moscow. And I think that there was this feeling that I had some, some kind of sympathy for this idea of what they were fighting for in terms of their independence, in terms of their sovereignty, in terms of the, the fundamental goals um, uh, that they had as a, as a country. They wanted to be sure I understood. And so, uh, and I think they felt that I, I could. Uh, I was the first woman uh, ambassador to serve in Uzbekistan, a very patriarchal country. I think we serve in many of those uh, overseas. And uh, there were certainly moments when I, when I had challenges, um, but I do think that, uh, that being an African-American did communicate this idea that I was there. Some of it was my personality and the way I tried to approach things. And some of it was um, the, the fact that I did come with this amazing history that I brought with me, carried with me every second of every day. And that that meant uh, a certain amount of understanding that would go, would go with it. You know, talking about perspectives, um, moving into the current conflict between uh, the Russian Federation and Ukraine, um, we hear on the nightly news, mainstream media, uh, of course, about you know the atrocities that are being levied against uh, the Ukrainian people, and you know Russia and Putin are basically being portrayed as um, you know these aggressors with 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 no real rational reason why they should go about uh, you know asserting themselves in this way. Um, so not to say that it's right, but is there a way that you can help us to understand? the rationale from the Russian perspective um, to this attack at this time? Well, um, Rabin, it's, it's an extraordinary time uh, in the long, long history of the Russian Federation and the nation of Ukraine. Very painful, and it is an attack. Um, in uh, my view, I certainly share the view that's been articulated by our president and secretary of state that um, Russia is the aggressor and that this is completely unprovoked and unjustified. What it reflects, though, is uh, something that actually came up in Ambassador Elam Thomas's remarks, which is the issues of history um, can show up as if they are yesterday. In the case of the Russian Federation, um, You've probably heard the famous quote that Vladimir Putin thinks that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. Mind you, we have had the Holocaust, we've had World War I, we've had um, nuclear uh, 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 weapons develop. We've had many, many things happen in the 20th century that were hideously terrible. But from his point of view, as he's thinking about Russia's security and its future, it is the Soviet Union, which means that Russia's greatness is very much something that he's attached to. There's a very long history between Russia and uh, Ukraine. They are similar in some ways, but very, very different in other ways. The, they are both Orthodox in terms of Christian, that's the major religion in both cases, although for a long period in the Soviet Union, uh, Russia was a country that had no religion. Um, and for Vladimir Putin, who wants to try to recover what he considers to be Russia's greatness, it means he must have two countries. Of all the countries that are part of the former Soviet Union, there are two that are crucial. Belarus is one and Ukraine is the other. And part of it has to do with the people. He has said many times he does not see Ukraine as a separate country. And he, there's also a strategic uh, issue, which is that Ukraine is situated, it can't move. It's situated between Eastern Europe and Russia. And he wants to be sure that uh, Russia does not become isolated. And so this is, and so that's the part of the, the way he articulates what he's trying to do. He wants to annex the country so that literally, instead of the, the having some kind of demarcation between 
Russia and Ukraine. There is none. He started it in 2014 with the takeover of Crimea. He's declared um, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk to be part of Russia. And now he just wants to take this on out to uh, the, the west of Russia. Of course, Ukraine is a separate and sovereign country. It has a long history of relations with Russia. Um, it also has a long history of racial relations with Eastern Europe. Uh, but, but for his um, recovery of what Putin believes to be Russia's lost place as a superpower in the world, he sees Ukraine as crucial to this. Um, and he, it's almost as if, and I, it's a strange way to put it, it's almost as if it's an attack of the kind that we have seen in uh, the United States. And he's saying to the Ukrainian people, stop resisting, stop resisting. You know, you are ours. And um, the Ukrainian people are telling him in the most brave and amazing way, we are Ukrainians and we will have our culture and we will have our country. Um, this is, I think, uh, we don't know how this is all going to unfold, but it has everything to do with the security perceptions of the leader, uh, Vladimir Putin, and what he wants to try to reconstruct in his view of what has to happen for Russia to become a superpower and a great nation again. What, what would you say to people who do blame some of the West's actions for his, his actions right now? What would you say to people who look at things like, you know, NATO expansion um, and say, you know what, Russia, like any other nation, has a right to protect their interests and to have um, uh, NATO expanding so much so that it's right at their borders is a legitimate threat. Like, what would you say to them um, when it comes to that? Well, what I would say is there are, countries have their own security perceptions. We have ours, uh, the Chinese have theirs, every country, including the Russian Federation, has its security perceptions. But there's absolutely nothing that justifies uh, unprovoked attacks on countries. There's nothing that justifies the killing of civilians and innocents. And what's fascinating about this approach that the Russian Federation is now taking is the question is, what is the end game? If the idea is to create a Russian state that is great in the sense that Putin wants, how does annihilating uh, people he says are the same as Russians, how does that help achieve his goal? It's not clear that he can really find a, a political outcome that is going to be sustainable on this current path. And so whatever may have been said about NATO expansion or any other issue, it can all be addressed through dialogue and negotiation. There doesn't need to be this kind of wanton, brutal attack on civilians to accomplish what? It isn't clear at all that Vladimir Putin is getting closer to his goal other than annihilating the population, but how does that actually help him make his country great again? My concern, Ambassador Spratlin, is the people who are in Russia who don't agree with him and who are willing, just as the woman who brought out the sign saying no more war, I was concerned about her well-being. I'm amazed that they have let her, she was detained, Yes, questions for 10 or 15 hours, but like many other journalists who are trying to speak truth to power, I don't think she has a chance of living very much longer. And the whole idea of freedom of the press is something that is an anathema to Putin and all of those within his sphere of influence. So I'm, for one who is ordinarily an optimist, I can't say that I am at this point. No, I wouldn't say that there's any reason to be optimistic at all. And I do agree that uh, that everything that that uh, Vladimir Putin is articulating, he has articulated for some years, going all the way back yes. to 2007, uh, when he was speaking at a big security conference in Munich and, and, uh, and basically made some of the same points that he's made in some of these kind of unhinged speeches that he's had uh, recently. Um, so we don't know whether he will or will not be able to achieve his goals, but I would say he needs a sustainable path to achieving something. Ukraine isn't going to move. Russia isn't going to move. They need to continue to live together as they have for, you know, a millennium. Over the last seven, over 75 years, since the end of World War II, the creation of the United Nations, the creation over time of the European institutions, the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, 
we have been trying, I won't say we've always succeeded, but we've been trying to live in a rules-based and rights-based order. Well, this is what President Putin is challenging. And that is the thing that is frightening because whatever ability we are going to have to fight for our rights, then we need to understand what kind of system of rights that is. And so to have that challenged in the way it's being challenged now, I think is potentially long-term, something that be, could be very concerning for the United States and for everybody who wants to live under the, the, the rules-based, rights-based system that incorporates uh, the UN Charter. And I think that's why this really matters to, to every person. I know that there's a lot of people around the world, particularly in the United States, particularly African-Americans, but all citizens that do see something of a contradiction um, and find it hard to sympathize or to engage in humanitarian efforts in support of the Ukraine in the face of what seems like all too familiar discrimination against people of African descent. So what, what ex two part question, what exactly is the status of African students stuck there, black students that are stuck in the Ukraine um, and that we've been hearing haven't been treated well by the Ukrainian people that we're supposed to have so much sympathy for and how can the Ukraine justify um, their treatment of African students considering um, what they're going through and them being uh, victimized or being situated as victims in this conflict? Well, it's an excellent uh, question, Rabin, this issue of when Black people show up, what actually happens in a moment of trial? And that is what we're seeing in Ukraine now. And uh, you've probably seen some of the reports from the independent uh, scholar, Terrell Starr, who's actually an African-American who is in uh, Ukraine, and he is trying to help some of the refugees uh, there. Um, what ended up happening, in case your audience has not heard, is that some of the students who are studying in Ukraine, and there's a long history of uh, African, Indian, uh, Latin American, Asian students stuff, uh, studying in parts of the former Soviet Union going all the way back, as I said, to 1960 with the establishment of Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow, it was also true in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. When the conflict broke out and, and the Russians attacked on February 24th, everybody went into survival mode and the, one of the first casualties of that was equal treatment. And so the African students, some of the African students, Asian students and others were pushed to the back or not even permitted onto the buses as people were trying to flee. Um, I would I, I think that this issue is being uh, addressed now. The UN Commissioner, High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, spoke out against this. Enough, some countries were able to bring uh, buses or other things, other means of transportation to get some of their citizens out. I think that's what India was able to do. But some of the African students were left stranded and were badly treated. And we've heard some of those poignant uh, videos. And so uh, I agree with you, it's hard to retain sympathy when you see the kind of discrimination that is happening in Ukraine. So it is something that needs to be uh, addressed for being because it is not acceptable that in the moment when Ukrainian people are being attacked unjustly um, uh, by the Russian Federation, that they would then turn around and not deliver uh, justice to the people who need an equality to the students who are trying to flee, who are supposed to be guests in Ukraine and are supposed to be protected by Ukrainian authorities. So this is definitely an issue that they need to do, to do better on. But Ukraine definitely has this responsibility. I think the authorities know they have this responsibility. The media has been doing a better job of reporting this story. And I think some of the students are getting out, but obviously injustice is inexcusable under any circumstances. Yes, thank you so much for just, you know, providing that perspective. Um, we're definitely going to be following, uh, we have no choice as Americans particularly, but we also do have an international audience. So the world has no choice but to continue following this conflict. And um, as a show that does focus on people um, of the African diaspora, we'll definitely be paying even closer attention um, or just as much attention to the plight of people of African descent in the Ukraine as well. So I just want to thank 
thank you on the behalf of uh, Cultural Caravan TV and our audience for your jewels, your words of wisdom, uh, sharing your experience, your journey as phenomenal women of diplomacy, um, the state of diversity in foreign affairs, as well as your perspectives on both uh, Russian culture and the current conflict. Uh, thank you so much. Well, I'd like to say that um, the Cultural Caravan has opened the doors for so many people with this kind of discussion. And I commend you for having done so because it says to me that there is an interest. You saw there was an interest and it was our pleasure to be here. You can understand also why I was very hopeful that my colleague Pamela Spratton, the good ambassador who was just spoken eloquently and well informed about the situation in a part of the world that I've never served in. But it tells you there is nothing that is beyond the boundaries of those that want to step outside of, as Ambassador Spratlin often says, their comfort zone. But if we can be helpful to young men and women who are looking towards careers in international affairs, I commend to them your programs, the books that you've mentioned and that Ambassador Spratlin has and not to hesitate to touch base with us. I really only have one thing to add to uh, Ambassador Elam Thomas's wonderful words. And I wanna thank her for the invitation to come be part of this and to thank you, uh, Urbine also for being such a wonderful host and for welcoming me and allowing us both to share um, our, our really amazing careers. And I will say that because I feel extremely grateful to have been a diplomat. I'm not gonna say every moment was rosy, but it was a, a phenomenal experience. Um, I just saw a LinkedIn post yesterday that said of the 3,400 or so people who served as US ambassador since 1893, only 158 have been black. And so that tells us that's less than 5%. So um, what you were doing is extremely important to lift up our experiences. We want to get the word out about the possibility of serving in a diplomatic a career. Obviously the United States of America has a long way to go before we are fully participating in this amazing career. And I just wanna thank the Cultural Caravan for giving us the opportunity to talk about uh, our, our experiences. So thank you very much. And I'd be happy to come back anytime. Thank you so much again. Please do share this episode and I'll see you next time on the next edition of Cultural Caravan TV. Mm -hmm.